Have you ever tried to tell an immature person that they're immature? It's a little bit of a challenge, isn't it? I mean, when you tell an immature person that they're immature, normally their response is, no, I'm not, you are, right? And then what they do is they suck you into this vortex of back and forth little kid banter that belongs at a junior high lunch table and then you just kind of walk away just throwing your hands up in the air, right? Basically, it's really difficult to tell immature people that they're immature, but that's what Paul was up against when he was talking to the church at Corinth. He was basically writing a letter to them to tell the immature people at Corinth that they were immature. And of course, some of them had already postured themselves to say, no, we're not, you are. They had already kind of put themselves in that spot But this is what Paul does. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in just a moment. But what Paul does in the beginning part of his letter is he begins by explaining some of these issues related to maturity. Now, uh, I would remind you that this is a church, Corinth, that Paul had founded some years earlier. I don't know quite how many years before he actually wrote this letter, uh, his first letter to the Corinthians. But let's just say it was in the neighborhood of about four years. So about four years earlier, Paul had founded this church. In other words, that means that he as an apostle traveled there, and while he was there, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people that were there in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a big city, and it was a big deal. And so Paul was preaching to them the gospel that Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, was also the Savior of the world. And that he came, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross for the sins of humanity, rose from the dead, and now we can have reconciliation to God the Father through what Jesus Christ has done if we put our faith and trust in he alone and not in ourselves. And so Paul preached this gospel to the church at Corinth, and there were some that came to believe. And when they came to believe, he formed them into a community of faith known as what we call the church. And so there was now a church established in Corinth made up of, initially, converts that Paul, through his preaching, had won to Christ. Now, Paul eventually left, and there were other people that came and preached the gospel and reached some people and did some teaching there in Corinth as well. One was a guy named Apollos, and Apollos came, and he began to preach and to teach, and he was a friend of Paul's, and some of the people there, (coughs) excuse me, some of the people there came to faith in Jesus Christ through Apollos' teaching, and as a result of that, you've got some people who came to Christ because of Paul, and some who came to Christ because of Apollos, and then, whether Peter made it there or not, regardless, he had an opportunity through some associates to preach his gospel in Corinth as well. He's sometimes called Cephas when you read the New Testament text, but his name, obviously, we know him as Peter. And so now there were people that came to Christ through the message that Peter had brought as well to Corinth. Maybe it was through uh, somebody representing him, but nonetheless. So now you got people who came to Christ through Paul and people who came to Christ through Apollos and people who came to Christ through Peter. And by the way, these guys were all on the same team. They were all on the same mission doing the same thing. But what happened in Corinth is because it was uh, kind of born in this Greek-speaking mental paradigm that says, I want to know everything I can about everything. I want to have the most knowledge of anybody anywhere and I want to I want to link up to who I think may give me that best opportunity because remember like the the university or academy system that we now know in western civilization was really born of the Greeks and the idea there was people would come to these great sages or these great philosophers and say tell me all that you know right but that's different than what the Jewish philosophy was which was a rabbinical philosophy and those students would come to their rabbi and they would say not only tell me all that you know but I want to be all that you are it was different so here in this system the Corinthian people basically thought that they were extraordinarily mature because they had gotten to a place where they were listening to a lot of teachers teach them things And now they had gotten into a place, even though they thought they were mature, where they started separating themselves out and dividing themselves out based on which teacher they affiliated with. You see, this was, even though they thought they were mature, this was a very immature group of people. These were adults with diapers. These were men with baby bottles. These were women with pacifiers. 
This was a, a very immature group of people, and you have to understand that when you see the church in Corinth because that's what it was. So what Paul does is Paul decides that he is going to do a, a few things. He, he makes and begins the argument in chapter 1, talking about their immaturity, and then he forwards that argument a bit in chapter 2, but in a little bit of a higher level way. But then in chapter 3, he starts to dial in on the very thing he started in chapter 1. And what he does, he kind of does it in a, in a threefold way. He basically says, I'm going to preach maturity to these people in Corinth. Then I'm going to preach maturity to the leaders of which he was one. And then I'm going to preach maturity through changing our perspective on the whole thing. That's what chapter 3 sets up to be. And we're going to look actually at the whole of the chapter in just our few minutes. And we'll be able to unpack that because what I want to do is this. I want to unpack what Paul was teaching them at Corinth and help us to see what Paul was saying to them at Corinth and how he preached maturity to them, he preached maturity to the leaders, and then he preached maturity through perspective. I want to do that first. And then after that, I want to make application by looking through the same lens. What I'll do after I talk to you about what Paul was saying to them, after all that's done, then I'm going to preach maturity to you. And then I'm going to preach maturity to me. And then I'm going to preach maturity through perspective. That's where we're headed. So let's begin, shall we? Here's the first thing that he did. He preached maturity to the people in Corinth, to the church in Corinth. And let's begin at the very beginning of chapter number three. It says this. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? All right, let's pause there. So Paul is preaching maturity to the people of Corinth, and here's what he starts out by saying. He starts out by saying, I wish that I could talk to you as spiritually mature people, but I can't. I, I can't talk to you. He said, in fact, you're, you're worldly. Now, let me pause right there for a second. There are some who read this text or have read this text and taught that what Paul is referring to here is a people who doesn't actually know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that these are actually not Christians because they are worldly. You can't be worldly and be spiritual at the same time. Well, true, Paul does designate this idea of being spiritual and this idea of being worldly as different things, but he's not trying to make different classes of people. It's very clear that Paul is talking to believers in Corinth. How does he begin verse one? Brothers and sisters, right? And then he says, I wish I could talk to you as mature, but you are infants in Christ, right? So he's saying, you're brothers and sisters. In other words, you're part of the family of God. And then secondarily, he's saying, you're in Christ. You're babies. You're in diapers. You're sucking a baby bottle. You're, you got a pacifier, but you are in Christ. You, you believe and you embrace the truth that I taught you from the very outset. So he's talking to believers. But he's frustrated because, frustrated, his frustration comes through on occasion when you read 1 Corinthians. You go, but yeah, isn't, but wasn't he under the inspiration of the Spirit of God when he was writing this? Yes. And the Spirit of God was frustrated with them too. That's why he was writing like he was writing because they should have been more mature, because four years prior, Paul brought the milk of the gospel to them, and they believed. And he wanted, while he was there, to go beyond milk into solid food, but they just couldn't do that. Now, don't set up a false contradiction here between milk and solid food. Milk is good. Solid food is good. But we are not destined as mature people to live on milk alone like babies do, right? So like for now, I'm a 44-year-old man. I like dairy. I like, a, I like me some milk, man. I like a big old fat, tall glass of milk. And if I've got a good cookie to dunk that bad boy in there, I'm good with that too. Now, that seems kind of funny and silly because you're 44 and you still like Dunkin' Cookies and all that stuff. And I'm embarrassed because whenever like Edie likes Starbucks or whatever, or Tim Hortons or wherever, she likes coffee. I don't drink it. But sometimes when we're out, if we, got a, we go on a little date or whatever, and maybe we go grab something to eat, and then she wants to stop by and get some coffee or whatever, and it's like, okay, whatever. And I mean, here's what's embarrassing. 
She'll go up there and I'd like a frappin' matcha kula bula papa tuba taba, you know, and she'll get whatever with some whipped cream and some cherries and bananas. Somebody fan me, you know, I mean, you got that whole thing going on, right? <laughs> then, and then I walk up, sir, what would you like? Milk. <laughs> oh, would you, you'd like milk in something? No, just do you have straight milk? Because I'm going to get one of those cookies over there and uh, I'm going to dunk that bad boy, right? <laughs> Yeah, this is the dating life of my wife and I, right? So it's kind of funny. I like milk, but I don't live on it. I also like meat. I like solid food. I like chicken. I like steak. I like fish. I like, right? I like whatever. I like to eat that stuff. Paul is saying, four years ago I came and I brought you the milk of the gospel and you believed. But you have stayed as babies that are only taking milk and you've not moved along to solid food. And for that, he was thinking to himself, I'm a little disappointed in that. And in fact, what he says here is he says, you can still see how worldly you are. It, you don't have to, I know it's hard for you to believe because you think you're so mature. Just like when you're talking to somebody who's immature, they think that they're the most mature person in the room, right? It's just how it is. I know you think you're mature, but you're not, and it's evidenced by all of the quarrels and jealousy that you've got going on among you. And what Paul is doing right here is he's actually circling back to the very argument he was making from the beginning of the letter. Notice what it says in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. It says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, another. I follow Apollos, another. I follow Cephas, which is Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. You see how it's even worse there, right? Because now they're going, okay, yeah, I'm a part of Paul. Well, I'm a part of Apollos. Well, I'm a part of Peter. And another one says, well, I'm a part of Jesus. Like Jesus is just one among, right? So we've got this group of people that thinks they're mature, but instead are actually kind of casting themselves in making divisions in their heart regarding some of the people who are teaching them there. What they thought is they thought it was a mature move somehow to make these teachers who had come among them rock stars. They thought it was mature. Paul who is one of those that they made into this, said, no, that's not good. And so he goes on to say in verse number five what really he wants them to know. Look what he says in verse five. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Functionally, what he's saying here is this. It's interesting because he says, here's what you guys are doing. You don't think that you're immature, but here's what you're doing. You're dividing yourselves among teachers that you want to affiliate with. I'm, a, I, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Peter. And now, probably when we start thinking about it, they were dividing around certain things that they really identified with with these particular teachers, right? I mean, if the truth be told, the likelihood is among those three guys, Paul and Apollos and Peter, Probably the best speaker amongst them was Apollos. He was likely the best communicator. And so maybe there were some that were there in Corinth that thought to themselves, you know, not only did, not only did he kind of preach and lead me to Christ, but he's just the best speaker. He's got a golden tongue. And when he, ta when he speaks, man, I just, I just really engage with it. And so I'm, I'm of Apollos, man. And then there's others who are like, well, I know Paul kind of stutters and stammers a little bit, but I don't know if you knew this, but he studied under Gamaliel. He's the smartest guy, like times 10, of any of these other people. Paul knows more than any of them combined. I mean, Paul, he studied under Gamaliel the rabbi, who was like an incredible guy in Judaism, and he not only understands the Jewish background, but he's also, he can also speak multiple languages, and he's a Roman citizen. This guy's smart. And then, basically, you got some of the rest of the dudes that were at the church in Corinth going, I like Peter. Peter kills things. 
snaps fish heads off with his bare hands. Peter's a man's man. Sometimes he gets in a little bit of trouble because he runs his mouth, but I kind of like that. He's Peter. So they kind of divided themselves among these people that they, that they associated, and right? Paul is saying, you think that it's mature to somehow do this? You've made a tremendous, tremendous mistake because what you fail to realize is this, is that we're all on the same team. We're, we're, we're all doing the same things. We're all after the same goal. We have one purpose. We've got different gifts. We've got different abilities. We've got different perspectives, but we're all after the same purpose, and that is to see a harvest of righteousness where you grow more into the image of Jesus. And so he uses this, um, this farming metaphor, right? He says, look, I mean, at the end of the day, here's what's happening. Notice, he, he just says it. He says, I planted the seed. I was the first one on site here in Corinth. This is what God called me to do. And what I did is I preached the gospel and some people came to know Jesus Christ and, and then we began the church. I planted the seed. And then after me, Apollos came and, and he watered. And maybe later, he doesn't say this, maybe later Peter had, had some opportunity to till the ground or pull up some weeds or do whatever, right? But he says this, he says, Here, here's what you fail to remember at the end of the day. God's the only one that can make things grow. This is what Paul is saying to Corinth. This is only God that can make things grow. It's not about me. It's not about, it's not about Apollos. It's not about Peter. And here's what he says. What are we anyway? We're servants. That's what we are. We're servants. It's like, look, you're God's field. And we just, we're just hired workers working on God's farm. We're just joining them in the process. All I'm doing is I'm sowing some seed and somebody else is coming along and they're, they're watering the seed and somebody else is tilling up the ground, but it's God's field and it's God that makes things grow. And so he's trying to remind them and preaching to them that they have to understand maturity is not in just linking yourself to one of their personalities, but ultimately, if their personality is getting in the way of these people in Corinth linking themselves to Jesus, they're missing the boat. This is not what Paul had in mind. He wanted them to grow in their faith in Jesus, not just based upon one of these personalities. So then he says, you're God's field, and then he changes the metaphor right there at the very end, right? He said, you're God's field, and then he says, God's building. And then he moves on to start speaking about the idea, and remember, when Paul is talking about building, he most often has, as the metaphor that's controlling that, the temple. It's what he's thinking of. And he'll show that to us in just a moment. So he preaches maturity to those that are at Corinth, but then he preaches maturity to the leaders, of which he certainly is one. I want you to pick up with me after he says all of what we just read. Pick up with me in verse number 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise or expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. So Paul begins by using now, he switched metaphors from this farming metaphor, and now he brings it into the field of construction. And he says, like an expert builder or a wise builder, I laid a foundation. In fact, it's the only foundation, Jesus. Jesus Christ is the foundation I laid in Corinth. And there have been people who have come after me that are building on that foundation. In other words, all in one breath, Paul, instead of dividing himself with people like Apollos and Peter, he's actually affirming their ministry. 
He says, there's people who have come and they have built on this foundation that I have put in the ground, which is Jesus Christ and his gospel. Now, he says this, but if you're a leader, like me or if you're a leader, you better be careful how you build. You better be careful how you build because there is only one foundation and you really only have permission to build Jesus. That's it. And so you need to remember that if you choose your building materials unwisely, it's not going to go well for you. If you choose wood and hay and straw to build this temple, that won't withstand the fire. And Paul says there is a day coming. He refers to it as the day. And what he refers to as the day, he is referring to the time where there will be people, human beings and leaders who will stand before God and give an account. And the reference there is this metaphor of fire. That standing before God in the fire of his investigation of what you have done, only that which is done with non-perishable building materials will stand. All that has been done with perishable building materials will be consumed, right? So if you use wood and hay and straw, when the fire goes, it's gone. But if you use gold and silver and precious stones, it will withstand the fire. So here's what he says to the leaders, including himself. When you are building this beautiful temple, not a physical building that he's talking about here. He's talking about the body of Christ, the church. When you are building this temple, make sure that you do it with eternal building materials and not temporary ones that are combustible and perishable. So that's what he reminds us of. And then he says to the leaders, here's why you need to be careful. Because this is God's temple. By the way, when you read this passage of scripture, it's not just referring to our individual, uh, our individual selves as being the temple of God. It's referring to our corporate self as being the temple of God. That's what's being referred to in this passage. There are other passages that speak to our individual self. This one is speaking to our corporate self. Because he's saying, you together are the temple in which the Spirit of God dwells in your midst. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if you were in the Old Testament time period when the construction of the actual physical temple was being built? Could you imagine being one of those construction workers? And people say, well, yeah, what job are you on? I'm building a house for the dwelling of Almighty God. Here's what I'd be doing with every stone. Right? And I wouldn't be using junk material. I'd want to make sure that every single thing that I was laying down, every single thing that I was doing was going to be the highest quality craftsmanship that I could offer, that was going to be done well, that it was going to be able to withstand. This is going to be a house for God. And so what Paul is saying is, leaders... You better remember something, that this temple is sacred, and you better build with eternal building materials. Then he preaches kind of a word through perspective after that, and here's what he says in verse 18, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the, knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, which is Peter, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Here's what he says. He says, you've got to stop being so childish because you've been deceived. You thought that just by puffing up your head that somehow that equals maturity. Not so. You see, in Corinth, they had this problem, and I know just from studying kind of the whole of this letter, and you've probably read this letter before, you know that they had a problem. That they, you know, Paul even says at one point, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Now, what he's not, he's not against knowledge. Paul is in favor of knowledge, but he is only in favor of knowledge to the point that we put it into practice. I've known some people in my world and probably have been one of those people in my world who knew a whole lot 
but didn't put it into practice. That doesn't equal maturity. Just because you know some stuff doesn't make you spiritually mature. It is not a one-to-one -one correlation just about what you know. Now, you need to know to be able to do. I understand that. But it's about putting this into practice. And Paul says, you've been deceived because you think you're mature, but you guys have divided yourselves in your hearts by setting up these kind of rock star teachers of which I'm one, and you've kind of elevated them to a place where maybe it is becoming perilously close to, the, to, to sitting on a throne that only Jesus should sit on. Paul says, that's not maturity at all. You've deceived yourselves. And you think you're wise, you should become a fool. You should become a fool so that you lay yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, you teach me. You be the one. You shape me. You're the only one that can mature me. And then he goes on to quote, you know, Job chapter number uh, whatever, uh, chapter 5, and Psalm chapter whatever, not 94, I think. That's probably in the margins of your Bibles. If I'm wrong, forgive me and grow up. Um, <laughs> just kidding. It's just a joke. <laughs> he says this. He says, look. All of these things are yours. All, you, you say, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm a Peter. And he says, hang on, they're all yours. All of them. They've all come to Corinth for the same purpose. Different gifts, different abilities, but they've all come for the same purpose, to see a harvest of righteousness that you might mature in your faith in Christ. It's not about in your heart pitting one against the other because Paul's saying, I've got news for you. We're all on the same team. We're after the same purpose. We are going to give account to God for the way that we fulfilled each of us, our individual tasks, but we are doing it for the purpose of seeing this temple be built, for seeing you grow in maturity and in likeness to the person of Jesus Christ. So he says, don't let yourselves be deceived. Everything's yours. And then he, then he says this. He says, not only are the teachers yours, but then he says this. The world. The world is yours. Life. Death. Present. The future. What? Yeah, he's saying, Do you, have you forgotten your inheritance here? You're, you're still living in the land of petty little jealousies and petty little squabbles and petty little quarrels. And have you forgotten your inheritance? That you are going to be a joint ruler with Jesus in the world? Have you forgotten that? And Paul even says in chapter number 6 of 1 Corinthians 6, listen to what he says there. Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more are the things in this life? You heard that right. God's people's destiny is to grow in maturity and in likeness of Jesus and will be joint heirs with Jesus, ruling the world alongside of him and even governing angels. This is the destiny of the people of God. And here we are saying, well, I'm Paul. I'm with Apollos. I'm with Peter. He says, stop with all the petty trivialities and grow up. Get a clear-eyed perspective of who you are and what your destiny is. So Paul preaches to the church at Corinth, Paul, and he preaches maturity to them, and then he preaches maturity to the leaders of which he is one, and then he preaches maturity through perspective. So I told you now what I'm going to do to apply this is I'm going to do the exact same thing. Uh, 1988, I was in college. You figured out by this point. I told you already I was, I'm 44, so that shouldn't be a big mystery to you. I was in college, and of course, I'm a product of, you know, the 80s by and large in terms of my high school and college years. And I was a sophomore at the University of Georgia. Before I'd really come into serious faith, you know, relationship with God, and I was there with one of my roommates in my apartment. His name's Greg, and we had the television on, and it was on a, a music television station. And uh, those of you who are younger, this is when music television stations played music videos. <laughs> it actually used to happen. Instead of these skanky shows that are on there all the time that are reality shows showing you the worst in human nature, basically. Now, I'm not running for office. You don't have to applaud. Um, so they used to show actual, you know, videos of like people that played music and showed videos. And so we were just watching casually. It was on the channel, you know, and I, I, we were probably just talking, whatever. I don't know if we were eating lunch. I have no idea what we were doing. But I do remember we weren't paying that close attention to what was on TV until this one song started. And when that song started, we were like, oh, 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 oh. right? It was, it was like something I hadn't heard before. I mean, it was rocking. It was different. It was just a different sound. And when you hear such a different sound, you just kind of go, 
what? And we just, m me and Greg, we were just glued. We were like, man. It was this band called Living Color. And as we were listening to them, some of you who are a product of the 80s, you know who they are, and the rest of you are going to go home and YouTube them. Um, I know, I know. I, I, by the way, I'm not saying it as a recommendation. I'm just saying this is what happened, all right? So we're watching, and this is just very different. And I was like, what? And I'm listening to this song, you know, and the song's called Cult of Personality. I'm the cult of, I'm the cult of. And I was going, you know? And I was like, this is, this is crazy. And their sound is so unique and different. And we were both like, when that, when that video finished, me and Greg looked at each other and were like, we never heard anything like that before. So the next day, serendipitously, the next day, Greg is walking around the, the uh, college campus. And as is wont on college campuses, there are lots of telephone poles and street poles that have uh, flyers stuck to them, right? Stapled to them or pasted on there or whatever for things that are coming. The next day, he sees a flyer that says, tonight at the 40-watt club, living color. He comes home, he's like, Gillis, you're not gonna believe it. He shows me the flyer, he's like, I, this can't be the same people we saw. They, why would they come to some little bitty you know, place to play here that only holds like 250 people, and they have this cool video now, it can't be the same group. And I was like, if it is, we should try and go. And he's like, okay, so we went. So the opening band was up there, and we're, we're asking people, do you know this band that's coming out afterwards? No, we don't know. We're just here. We know what. Okay, do you know if they sing this song, Cult of Personality? Da -da 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 you know, and I'm doing that. And when you're doing that in the midst of that place, it sounds terrible. Here, it sounded phenomenal, right, just then? But there, it didn't sound as good. So we're asking them, you know, and they're like, I don't know. And sure enough, after that opening band finishes, they come out, it's them. I was like, yes. It's them. And they come out playing just, they're freakish musicians. I was just like, what is going on? My mind was blown, right? And then they do that song, Cult of Personality. And they're singing in this song about an idea that there are people who have blindly followed these kind of uh, propaganda machines around personalities for many, many years. And they, you know, they're naming certain dictators and, and political leaders, but they're also talking about ways in which people, human beings, make people kind of, there's a cult of personality which they impose upon people as well. So that idea was the first time I'd ever really been exposed to that particular idea, the cult of personality. I came to find out eventually that this was a statement that actually began uh, probably from the pen of a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. And he was writing, um, speaking kind of in secret in 1956 to a group of people about Joseph Stalin. And he talked about the cult of individualism or the cult of personality. And so he was talking about this idea how one person can kind of, through their personality, shape everything and, and people can kind of blindly follow that or that people in mass will make them to be something maybe that they want them to be. It's this idea of the cult of personality. Now, the reason I say that to you is because I say that that's a part of what Paul was hitting on, that idea. It wasn't stated in that way at that time, but that's a part of what he was hitting on, this cult of personality. And unfortunately, in our day and age, because I told you what I'm doing right now is I'm preaching maturity to you. I'll get to me in a second. But I'm preaching maturity to you. In our day and age, we have fallen prey to the cult of personality, even in the church. Even in the church, we've fallen prey to the cult of personality. I say this with a broken heart, not as, a, not as somebody to, to grind an ax or anything, but pull up a church website and see if it's all about the personality of the person leading it or if it's not. Something to think about. Who's marketed? Jesus or the individual personality? Because that's, that's a part of what was going on in Corinth and people were dividing over those things. You know, I, I fear to say that in the church of Jesus Christ we've sometimes, you know, sometimes it's been the actual personality who have kind of started their own marketing and propaganda machine to make themselves somewhat bigger than life, even in the church, even in the church. How awesome I am, how powerful I am, how everything I do, and you just kind of go, okay. But then there's other times where people make those people into those things. Either way, it ultimately won't be healthy, and I'll tell you why. Because if your deep attachment is to a personality other than Jesus, you will be stunted in your growth you will remain in a place of immaturity. Jesus is the only one. He's the only one that can cause things to grow, right? It happens with 
speakers and musicians and all that kind of stuff in the Christian world. Uh, let, me, let me just make up a scenario. Here's a for example. Let's say there's a large church in the United States in, in a, a relatively cold and snowy part of the country. And let's say that they, they had a really, really excellent um, musical worship leader who God called away to another part of the country, I don't know, Tennessee or somewhere. <laughs> I'm just making this up, it's completely made up. And then let's just say that I overheard someone say, and now that so-and-so is not leading me in worship, I just don't know if I'm gonna be able to worship anymore. At best, that's childish. At worst, it's idolatrous. Let's say that there's a large church in a geographical portion of the United States that's in the Northeast. Just making this up. Let's say that that particular place has a few different people who speak in that context. And let's say I overheard someone when they came to church and realized it wasn't the speaker that they were most fond of, say, I don't even know if I can stay. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can receive the word unless so-and-so is giving it to me. At best, that's childish. At worst, it's idolatrous. Paul says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants. What is Jerry Gillis? What is Pat Jones at Eastern Hills Wesleyan? What is Tony Evans in Dallas, Texas? What is Billy Graham? What is Francis Chan? What is Chris Tomlin? What is Hillsong United? What is Benji Cowart? Servants. Servants. Now, that word translated does not mean slaves. What it means is table waiters. That's what the word means. For instance, if I could change the metaphor from the farm, which Paul used, I'll change the metaphor to the restaurant. I don't make the food. I don't own the restaurant. I just serve. I just serve it. It's what I do. That's, that's, what, that's what those who are leading us, hey, they, they don't own the restaurant. It's God. They don't make the food. It's God. They just, they just serve it. Right? It, and by the way, who am I? Who is someone else? Just servants about the same purpose who are serving you what God has made. And by the way, God's the only one who can make it grow. I got news for you. If you think to yourself, and I've heard this said, if you think to yourself, I'm looking forward to Sunday. I can't wait to go get me some Jerry. It's been said to me. How awkward is that? <laughs> you better hope that you come and you get yourself some Jesus. Because he's the only one that can mature you. Yeah, I, I've been to plenty of restaurants like you have. I go to restaurants all the time and, and maybe I come into a restaurant and my waiter comes out and you know, he's super personable and I like him a ton and he's, he's cool. And, you know, and I'm like, man, I, I like this waiter. You know, he takes my, my order and you know, comes by and checks on me and all that kind of stuff. But then when it's time for the, food come, for the food to come, as you know, the waiter's waiting on some other tables sometimes and other people come out and bring your food. 
You know, Sir, is this your chicken? Yeah, it's my chicken. Is this your cauliflower and chicken nuggets? I guess they're trying to cancel out one another. Yeah, whatever, right? And they serve you food. How ridiculous would it be if I was at a restaurant and I, I really like this waiter and then they come out and bring my, you know, I'm starving and they come out and they bring my food. Sir, is this, hey, hey, ho, 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 ho. One second there, partner. Where's my waiter? He's, he's waiting on some other tables right now. I'm just bringing the food, you know. No, 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 no. My waiter, bring my food. <laughs> Sir, uh, same cook, same kitchen. I'm just transporting the food to your table. That's all I'm doing. I don't care what you're doing. I want my waiter, and I want him to bring my food. If that happened, do you know what would happen? to my food? <laughs> Those of you who've worked in a restaurant before? <laughs> That's at worst. But at best, you know what they're gonna say? This guy's a lunatic. He's a baby. This guy's just a child, he's a baby. I came out and tried to bring his food. He's like, no, my, wait my waiter's gotta bring my food out. It's the same cook, man. All I'm doing is taking the plate, handing it here. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a number of people that speak here at the chapel. I'm one of, I speak the majority of the time. That's part of my job. But there's a number of speakers. Doesn't matter if it was Dion, Drake, or Wes Aram, or Daryl, or Jonathan, or whoever, it doesn't matter, right? All on the same team all doing the same thing, all table waiters, servants, just bringing out a meal that we didn't cook. God cooked it. It's his kitchen. It's his restaurant. It's his church. And we are just here to serve. Now, that is part of the perspective that you need to have because I told you I'm going to preach maturity to you. And you need to have that because you cannot let anyone get perilously close to the place in your heart that only Jesus deserves. Now, hear me. I realize there are lots of people that watch us on television. I was just reminded here. Lots of people that watch us on television. Lots of other pastors, lots of other people at other churches before they go to their church. I get it. And you're watching us online. Let me say this. You have no right to disrespect or treat as slaves your pastors or your leaders. You don't have a right to do that. That's not what they're there for. Here's what you need to understand. You have every right to honor them. You should honor them. That is important, as long as they are honorable. If they are honorable, then they should be honored. That's what the scripture says. In fact, the scripture in Hebrews chapter 13, I don't have to remind you, it says, obey those leaders who are watching over your souls. And don't cause them problems. Let them do that with joy instead of with being a pain in the neck. That's what it says in the actual Greek language. <laughs> right? It, it, that's what it says. It says honor them and, and follow their lead as they follow Jesus. If they are honorable people, that you are to do those types of things. But, 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 they're not rock stars. They're not. And don't put them on a pedestal where no human being is supposed to be able to live. That's for Jesus. He's the star. So, I preach maturity to you. I told you I'm preaching maturity myself. Jerry, sit down. I need to tell you some things. Here's the first thing. Look at the foundation of which the church is built on. It's Jesus. Do not, under any circumstance, build on that foundation with anything other than Jesus. Are you clear? If you do, if you choose building materials that are wood, hay, and straw, things like your own ego, things like trying to bring yourself glory instead of me glory, things like that, things like making these people your personal affirmation group so that you feel awesome about yourself? 
If you ever try and fleece them or you do anything that you try and do for personal glory that you're building on their backs and stepping on their heads in the process, you need to understand something. All of that will burn up because you will stand before me and you will give an account for what you have built with. It will burn if it's ego driven, if it's self glory driven, it will burn up because it's perishable. You need to understand another thing that this is my temple, not the building, the people. And they're sacred. If you don't do these things, you will have nothing to show for your work. You will be saved because you are my child. I know that you love me. I know that I've transformed you and nothing will separate you from my love, but you need to understand you'll have nothing to show from your fruits of your labor because you've acted worldly instead of acted mature. And you've chosen your own cult of personality called you instead of the only name that saves, which is Jesus. So don't do it. Sorry, needed to talk to Jerry for a moment because that's what Paul did. I'm not done with you. <laughs> you also need to remember something. You better always look through an eternal lens and be reminded that you are going to stand before me and give an account for what you built with. Thinking about that right now is a little bit overwhelming. You better build with things that last, like the gospel. You better build by teaching the whole counsel of God and not just bits and pieces. You better build with the right heart, a heart that is abandoned to God and pure before God, because those are the only things that are going to last. Let me give you a last thing, some perspective, and then we'll be done. Here's the perspective that Paul ended with, with the church at Corinth. He said, don't be deceived. In, in fact, he was basically saying you already are kind of deceived because you think you're mature when you're not. He says to all of us, don't be deceived. Just because you know some stuff, it doesn't mean that you're mature. How are you living? What is your life saying you are? What is the fruit of your life saying you are? What do your loves and passions say you are? This ultimately is where we have to run. He says, don't be, don't be deceived. You think that because you've been around the church or you've known Jesus for a number of decades, yet you haven't grown. You've known him for a number of decades, but when's the last time that you had a conversation with anybody about Jesus? But you're going to tell everyone how mature you are. You won't even think about letting God make you into a generous person. But you want everybody to think how mature you are. There's lots of applications here. He says to all of us, me, and you, don't be deceived. Because you need to understand that while you're squabbling over petty things, and by the way, some of you are in some very, very petty scenarios right now. I have no idea what they are, but you're in very petty scenarios. Petty relational scenarios, little things that happened at work, and you've made such a big deal of something that really wasn't that big a deal. Maybe the people that even did it didn't even do it with a wrong heart, but you're all been out of shape and you can't let it go. You need to grow up. You're over here playing in a little pool of mud when the beautiful ocean of God is right next to you. And God's saying to you, do you not know what your inheritance is? Do you not know what your destiny is? Your destiny is to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus because you're going to be a joint heir with me. This is your inheritance. We have an inheritance that is so unspeakably incredible we can't even give words to it. And in fact, God says, 
in relationship to this inheritance, he has given us the spirit of God to dwell in our hearts as a deposit or a down payment on what is to come. And you know that there are those moments in your life, if you truly know Jesus, there have been some of those moments in your life where no one else was around and in the quietness of your heart, God just stormed you overwhelmed you and you were just like your presence, your awesomeness, your grace, your love, it's stunning to me. That is a down payment for the life we are going to be leading. That is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So here's the challenge. Don't grieve the spirit by staying in immaturity. God's destiny for you and God's destiny for me is to be people who grow beyond being adults with diapers, beyond being adult men with baby bottles or adult women with pacifiers. Leave the trivialities, leave the pettiness, and know Jesus. If there is going to be a cult of personality, Let it be the personality of God's son, Jesus the Christ. He is the only one who can grow us. He is the only one who can shape us. He is the only one who has the whole world in his hands. So let me ask you to do something as a way of application. And then I'm gonna pray for you and let you go. As a way of application. Instead of you assessing yourself, what are some areas that you need to spiritually mature in. See, if you assess yourself, that might get a little froggy. Because you might go, you know, I've thought about it, and I'm good. I am so good. Right? Here's what I want you to do. How about have somebody in your world, in your sphere, that knows you, and that is godly. I'm not talking about somebody who knows way more about Kim Kardashian than they do the New Testament. (laughs) I'm talking about somebody who is godly. And you ask them, what do you see as some areas maybe, some growth opportunities for me and my spiritual maturity? And when they tell you, and they say, these are some areas I think you could mature in, and you say, No, they're not. They're areas you should mature in. (laughs) Then those people may be on to something. Okay? Part of the recognition of your maturity is how you handle people challenging you to grow. So, let God's Spirit show you. Would you bow your heads with me? We're gone in just a moment. And I would simply ask this. First, if you're here and you've never before come into relationship with God through his son Jesus, I need you to know you can't self-help your way to God. You can't somehow just try and make yourself a better version of you. You have sinned and come short of the glory of God like the rest of humanity. And until you turn from your sin and from being your own Lord and Master and Savior and turn your heart toward God through his son Jesus Christ, by faith. You will never know what it means to be transformed. So, if you need to understand what that relationship looks like, and you say, that's a missing piece in my world, then when we dismiss in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come by the fireside room, again, clearly marked out in the atrium. There's pastors and some other friends in there, and just let them know that's what you want to do. They'd love to take a moment, share some with you, pray with you, send you home with something that's going to help you in this new journey of faith. That's it. No big string attached. But it's going to be up to you. I'm not going to manipulate you into that. But if God's doing this in your heart, act on it. Follow through. Father, you said much to us today. Uh, There's much more to say, and forgive me for that which I failed to say or that which I didn't say as I should have, God, but whatever was truth and whatever was honorable and whatever was of you, I pray you'd write it on our hearts. And Father, I pray that we would learn what it means to walk in maturity. This is a destiny you have designed for us. But maturity just doesn't mean simply being a better version of ourselves. 
It means being a more Jesus-like version of ourselves. And I pray that you would help us to see that no other human personality, though there are many that can help us and can influence us and can point us in those directions, just like Paul did and he said, as I follow Christ and you follow me, God, there's honorable people to walk after and to emulate. But Father, may we never be guilty of allowing personalities or people or success or fame or money or reputation or anything ever sit in the seat of the preeminence of Jesus in our lives. And help us, God, to ask hard enough questions in our own world that we realize that at times we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're mature when we're not. Help us to grow in those areas so that people would see Jesus more than us because that's what the world needs. They need more Jesus and less us. Help us learn what that looks like and show us tangible ways whereby the Spirit, we can surrender to you and you can shape us in that. So we trust you now to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. Love you guys.